On November 13, 1946, a single propeller airplane took off from Schenectady County Airport with a rather unique payload. Six pounds of dry ice and a rather unique mission. The pilot was a chemist named Vincent Schaefer, who had been conducting clandestine experiments at the General Electric Research Laboratory. Using a GE freezer chilled to sub-zero temperatures, Schaefer created clouds using his breath as condensation and seeded those man-made clouds with dry ice. The dry ice crystallized a chemical reaction that caused snow crystals to form in that freezer. A few months later, it was time for a field test. So Schaefer rented the plane, flew into a cloud, and dumped, dumped the dry ice. Eyewitnesses on the ground said it was almost like the cloud exploded. The subsequent snowfall was visible for 40 miles away. The G monogram had a little fun with Schaefer's benchmark breakthrough. Schaefer made it snow this afternoon over Pittsfield. Next week, he walks on water. The science of seeding clouds is a marvel, marvel of modern science, but the idea is as old as the prophet Elijah. We're in a series called Win the Day. We talk about six habits. Flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, fly the kite, cut the rope, wind the clock. It's time to seed the clouds. Habit seven. First Kings 18. Let me sit and see. It has not rained in Israel for three and a half years. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. That's when and where and why the prophet Elisha climbs to the top of Mount Carmel and seeds the clouds. Kind of sort. 1 Kings 18 starts with verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant said, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. So Elijah shouted, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and he took his cloak into his belt. He ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I love the subplot. We're not sure what route Elijah ran, but it's no less than 17 miles. May have been as many as 30 miles. And he beat Ahab's chariot. I'm hearing the chariots of fire thing in my head right now. Long before Phidippides ran from Marathon to Athens. Elijah ran from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. Awfully impressive. But all right, let's
Let's drive into, dive into habit number seven together. How do we see the clouds? Well, let me make it as simple as one, two, three. One, you see the clouds with prophetic imagination. Two, you see the clouds with patient persistence. Three, you see the clouds with bold prayer. More than a half a century ago, Dr. Alfred Tomatus was confronted with the most curious case of his 50-year career as a world-renowned auto, or y'all have to forgive me for this one, auto geologist <laughs> even though I've looked over it five times. <laughs> a renowned opera singer had lost his ability to hit certain notes, even though those notes were well within his vocal range. He had been to other specialists, all who thought it was a vocal problem. Dr. Tomatis thought otherwise. Using a sonometer, Dr. Tomatis discovered that the opera singer was producing 140 decibel sound waves at a meter's distance. That's louder than a military jet taken off of an aircraft carrier. Long story short, the opera singer had been definite by the sound of his very own voice. He could no longer hit the notes because he could no longer hear the notes. The voice can only reproduce what the ears can hear, said Dr. Tomatis. The French Academy of Medicine dubbed it the Tomatis effect. And the ramifications are pretty profound. Here's my theory. All of us have problems. Relational problems, emotional problems, spiritual problems. And we think those problems are the problem. But I think many, if not most of those problems, are persistent problems. The root cause of our problems is a hearing problem. It's ears that haven't been deafened to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. How? One reason is the white noise of culture. We are bombarded with news and false news every minute of every hour of every day. We've got online advertisers using clickbait. We've got social media algorithms designed to keep us in our echo chamber. It's hard for God to get a word in edgewise, but I don't think this is our primary problem. Our primary problem is our own self-talk. We are deafened by the sound of our own voice. Like that opera singer, we talked about, in habit one, flipping the script, about 60,000 thoughts far across our synapses every day. According to the Cleveland Clinic, 80% of those thoughts are negative. I'll say it again, scripture is our script cure. It's the way we renew our minds. Romans 12 is the way we tell ourselves a better story. It's the way we turn our turn up the volume on God's voice. I asked a question a few weeks ago, worth asking again. What percentage of you, of your thoughts, words, and actions are a regulation of the news media you watch? 
and the social media that you follow. There are algorithms designed to keep you in your echo chamber. The net result is an ear that cannot hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Now let's flip the script. What percentage of your thoughts, words, and actions are the revelation you're getting from God's Word? we got to be grounded in God's Word. When we open the Bible, God opens His mouth. The best way to turn up the volume on that still small voice is daily Bible reading plan. All right, let me set that with verse 41. Elisha said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Elisha hears something no one else even is listening for. He hears something that hasn't happened in more than three years. How? Elisha has a prophetic ear. And that's where a prophetic imagination starts. Let me give you a definition. Prophetic imagination is seeing the invisible, hearing the inaudible, and believing the impossible. Walter Bergerman says it this way. The test is reframing so we can re-experience the reality that are right in front of us from a different angle. Sometimes it takes the form of supernatural gifts, like a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. Sometimes it takes the form of supernatural solutions, like the spiritual gifts or the sermons or healing. Either way, I call them God ideas. And I'd rather have one God idea than a thousand good ideas. How do you get a God idea? It starts with a prophetic ear. An ear that is fine-tuned to still small voice of the Holy Spirit. That is precisely what is happening in verse 41. It hasn't rained in three and a half years. His forecast seems foolish, right? It seems like Elijah is out of touch with reality. There is an old saying, those who don't hear the music think the dancer is mad. When you exercise prophetic imagination, it may seem like you're out of touch with reality. But it's because you are in touch with a reality beyond your five senses. Things you can taste, touch, see, or smell, or fear, feel. In the first century BC, there was a drought, not unlike the drought Elisha experienced. It threatened to destroy a generation, the generation before Jesus. There was a man who had an Elijah anointing. The people asked him to pray for rain, and he did something curious. He did climb Mount Carmel. He took his staff and drew a circle in the sand. Then he knelt inside that circle. And he prayed this prayer. Sovereign Lord, I swear before your great name that I will not leave this circle until you have mercy upon your children. It was a bold prayer. And we'll talk about bold prayers in a moment. According to the Talmud, Hani the circle maker was captivated by one phrase in one verse of scripture, Psalms 126.1, 1, 
when the Lord, the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. That phrase, we were like men who dreamed, provoked a question that Honey wrestled with his entire life. Is it possible for a person to dream continuously for 70 years? Now hold that thought. Longitudinal studies have shown that as we age, we cut the cognitive center of gravity tends to shift from the right brain to the left brain. This is an oversimplification, but the left brain is the locus of logic. The right brain is the locus of imagination. That neurological tendency presents a problem. At some point, most of us stop living out of imagination and we start living out of memory. We stop creating the future and start repeating the past. We stop living by faith and start living by logic. That is when we stop living and start dying. Most people die long before the date on their death certificate. But it doesn't have to be that way. Without a vision, says the writer of Proverbs, the people perish. Vision is a preservative. If you have a vision, you are never past your prime. If you have a vision, you never age out. Just as Caleb. He's as strong at 85 as he was at 40. How? Vision. It's an expression of prophetic imagination. But guess what? It takes patient persistence. If you want to dream big, you have to think long. You have to play the long game. One or two things happen over time. Either your memory overtakes imagination, or imagination overtakes memory. Imagination is the way we seed the cloud to the third and fourth generation. And it takes patient persistence. Now let me zoom out. I love verse 44. I saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. That is an awful, that's awfully small, isn't it? But that isn't the issue. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. If you do things like they're big things, God will do big things like they're little things. You have to attempt things that are beyond your ability, beyond your resources, beyond your education, beyond your experience. That's when and where God shows up and shows off. I'm not sure who said it, but I heard a pastor say it a long time ago, do things that are twice your size. In other words, stretch your faith. Here's another lesson. When you are faithful here, you don't always experience the blessing right then and there. But God will bless you somehow, some way, somewhere. It says that Elisha asked his servant to go and look for rain seven times. That's not an insignificant number in scripture. Proverbs 24, 16 says, though the righteous fall seven times they rise again one way I study scripture is by taking a word or a phrase 
and plugging it into a Bible search. I took that little phrase seven times, and it's amazing how many times it pops up. Now, seven is the number of perfection or completion. So it's used literally and figuratively. Either way, so many sevens. Abraham bowed to the ground seven times in Genesis 33. The priest consecrated the altar by sprinkling it seven times in Leviticus. The word of the Lord is like silver refined seven times in Psalms 12. Jesus ups the ante and tells us to forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. But I want to focus on three inciting incidents. The Israelites circled Jericho seven times on the seventh day and Joshua six. Naaman dips himself in the Jordan River seven times in 2 Kings 4. And of course, Elijah prays for rain seven times in 1 Kings 18. Have you ever heard of counterfactual theories? It asks the what if question. Let me play the counterfactual theories. What if the Israelites had stopped circling after their sixth circle on the sixth day? What if Naaman stopped after six dips? What if Elijah had quit praying after his sixth attempt? You know the answer. They would have forfeited the miracle right before it happened. Seed in the clouds is all about patient persistence. Consistency beats intensity. Seven days a week and twice on Sunday. You keep on keeping on. Jesus said it this way. Ask, seek, and knock. Those are present clerical verbs. In other words, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. It's too soon to quit. It's too soon to give up. You can see the clouds in lots of ways, but none are more powerful than prayer. A bold prayer is a powerful, is a powerful that powerful prayer that is beyond your ability, beyond your resource, beyond your imagination. In other words, you can't do it. You are praying for something impossible. But a bold prayer is also a prayer that's you pray a hundred times. And God has not answered that prayer when or where or how you ask. But you don't feel released. You keep praying that prayer. I don't know what miracle Believe in God, believe in God for, but it's too soon to quit. Can you hear God counting count down? Keep seeing the cloud with faith, hope, and love. In 853 BC, a king named Jehoram assumed the throne of Judah. He's the fifth king of the southern kingdom. It's 117 years after the death of David. And this is what 2 Kings 8.18 says. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He killed his brother so he would get the throne. But that's not the end of the story. It says, nevertheless, for David's sake, 
the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. This is so powerful to me. David is long gone. This is six kings later. But God has not forgotten his promise. Has not forgotten his people. That's what happens when we see the clouds. There is no expiration date on love. There is no expiration date on faith. There is no expiration date on prayer. We are beneficiaries of prayer. We know nothing about. We have we harvest fields. We did not plant. We drink from wells. We did not dig. We live in houses. We did not build. We think right here and right now. God thanks nations and generations. We think that God does for us. What God does for us is for us. It's never just for us. It's always for third and fourth generations. See the cloud when the day. May you grow the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.